Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Hey, the road you're on, adventure will come. That's true enough. I don't know whether you've all ever set out on a, a long journey in the car or on the bus or on the train, and you get halfway down the, the road, and it comes from the back seat. Are we there yet? Anybody experienced that? Are we there yet? On the surface, a simple four words, just a little question, but there's something about are we there yet that kind of makes you just kind of draw in breath and think, no, we're not, but we're on the way. Perhaps it reminds you of long journeys. Sylvia and I used to use all kinds of strategies to keep our three from saying, are we there yet? We would play games, we would listen to story tapes, uh, we would play I Spy, we would sing together. We even got lost once because I was concentrating more on the singing than the route finding and we ended up in Malton in North Yorkshire for some reason. But uh, we're talking about a journey uh, and we're going to look at a particular scripture uh, in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. It's quite a short scripture and it will come up on your screen now. There it is. Um, here are the stages in the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. At the Lord's command, Moses recorded the stages in their journey, and this is their journey by stages. So that seems a fairly innocuous little uh, couple of verses, doesn't it? But I think, actually, when I read it a few weeks ago, it kind of jumped out at me, and I thought, there's some things here that we need to grasp. There's a reason why God put that in. Um, and those two little verses are followed by a list of 47 places uh, that they passed through from Egypt to Canaan. And it's one of those passages where it's pretty easy to skip through pretty quickly, to be honest, because they're all place names. Um, but I think there's a reason that they're there. So this is a, a historical journey by real historical people. But as well as that, this morning we're going to use it as an illustration of the faith journey that we're on as Christians. If that's a new idea to you, imagine, if you will, that the starting point in Egypt represents the life you and I were living before we became Christians. And imagine if crossing the Red Sea, as they did, represented our experience of being born again. And what if this list of places and experiences actually had a parallel in our Christian walk? And what if that glorious destination that they were headed for also had a parallel for us? Now, the New Testament uses a similar uh, picture Although in the New Testament, it talks more often about a race. Um, that's not to say that it's a comp competition, just that it's a course to be followed. The writer of Hebrews writes, let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And of course, many of you know that it's the form of allegory that John Bunyan used when he wrote his famous Pilgrim's Progress about 350 years ago. It's the journey of a man called Christian who travels towards his destination in life and experiencing all kinds of dramatic highs and lows. So it's the same picture. It's a walk of faith. Your life is, as a Christian is like a journey, a course to be run. And I think that knowing where you've been and knowing where you are and knowing where you're going make a big difference to our confidence and our sense of expectation. Now, as I said, it's tempting to skip through the rest of Numbers 33 without paying too much attention to it. That's partly because the place names have no particular significance for many of us. But of course, to the original readers, they would have known where these places were and what happened there. Each place name would be recognizable to them, just like place names uh, immediately uh, bring a particular memory for us. 
So I mention Saltburn, and immediately your mind goes to ice cream and paddling and sunshine or fish and chips, yeah? If I mention the Lake District, everybody thinks of rain, exactly. <laughs> so many of us associate place names with experiences. And certainly in our walk as Christians, there are places and times and people that you will associate with particular experiences of the Godhead. So if, for instance, you mentioned Spennymoor to me, you might think, hmm, Spennymoor. If you're online and you don't know where Spennymoor is, it's just a little town about 20 miles northwest of here, uh, with not particularly anything special about it, you might say. But you mentioned Spennymoor to me, and I recall going to a, a, a day's conference there many years ago, actually, but had a profound experience of God. I was wiped out by the Holy Spirit that day. Now, I don't know anything else about how we got there or what the guy said or whatever, but I do know that at the end of the meeting, somebody prayed for me and I was cleaned out, literally cleaned out inside and outside and delivered of all kinds of nasty things. So Spennymoor, wow, that's where God was that day. So the Old Testament reader would do the same. He'd read his list of places and be reminded of the significance of each one. So it's as though we're going to hold up a mirror to their journey and see some of our own experiences. So I think there are three important truths that I want to bring to you today. The first one is this. You are not where you were. Look in the mirror. You've come a long way. You are not where you were. Okay, let's go back to our, our journey from Egypt to Canaan. The first place name on the list is a place called Ramesses. That was a place in Egypt. And the mention of this place would remind the Israelites that that's where they were in slavery. It was a place where they would still be if God hadn't rescued them. They were slave to somebody else. They were building somebody else's kingdom. The Pharaoh that long since had, had favored Joseph had died. And the new king just saw the Israelites as a threat. And he wanted to repress them. So he says that they made their lives bitter with hard labor. The king even issued an instruction to kill all the baby boys to stop the Israelites growing in number and in strength. So in the same way, you and I need to remember where we would be if God hadn't rescued us. Never lose sight of your own story of being rescued by God. It was wonderful a couple of weeks ago to hear Steve Sewell's testimony. It's a dramatic testimony. It's still on uh, social media if you want to revisit it. It's a great testimony of his release from addiction to heroin. He broke free and is a new man. It's a dramatic story. Not everybody has a dramatic story. I don't. My story's never going to make it into a book. It's not very exciting, but it was very, very real. And looking back, I can recognize that before Jesus saved me, I was trapped. I was trapped in insecurities and fears. Trapped by the need to fit in. Trapped by ways of thinking and speaking that I felt I had to conform with. I might never have called it slavery exactly, but God did. I suspect if we're honest with ourselves and with God, we can all look back and recognize things that trapped us. Habits, obsessions, misplaced loyalties. Or maybe you were slaves to alcohol or to drugs or to promiscuity or to body image. You see, Jesus recognized that everybody needed setting free. 
So looking at that list of place names in Scripture, God was reminding the Israelites that they were not where they were. And he says to you this morning, you are not where you were. You are walking into freedom. And if you're not yet a Christian, or you don't know whether you are or you're not, actually the same applies to you. You are not where you were. The fact that you are listening to this right now is evidence that God is starting to show you some things. You're no longer in the dark. It's as though God turned on a light and you see things now that you haven't seen before or perhaps haven't seen for a very long time. Now, you may not understand everything that you're seeing and hearing, but you will recognize that some curious coincidences have been happening, some quite personal prompts to your thinking are slowly bringing you into a better understanding of what Jesus has done for you. Looking back tells us how far we've come. We are not where we were. God has got us this far. And we must never lose that gratitude to God for what he's done. Which takes us to the second thing that I think God wants us to remember today. You are where you are. Fairly obvious, isn't it? You are where you are. But there's a picture of a long and winding road. Possibility for a song there. And it goes through a difficult place. You see, as soon as the Israelites broke free from Ramesses, they were free. They were no longer slaves. The next 45 place names on the list would all remind the Israelites of what happened next. Here are a few of the places. I won't go through all 45. We'll be here all day. But some of them had particularly significant events. So Pi Hahiroth, if that's how you pronounce it, is next to the Red Sea. And it would remind the, re the readers of how they thought they'd escaped from Pharaoh, but came up against the impassable barrier of the Red Sea, with Pharaoh fast approaching behind them. And they'd remi be reminded that their reaction was to moan and complain. And then also reminded that before their very eyes, God parted the water and took them through. At Mara, another place name, they complained that the water was bitter and God miraculously made it sweet. At the desert of Zin, they grumbled again against Moses and Aaron because there was no food. They said they wished they were back in Egypt. God literally rained down food on them. At Rephidim, another place, they faced opposition from the Amalekites and God gave them victory. At Sinai, they created a golden calf. They turned their back on God and God spared them and spoke with them and led them on. So each place, you see, reminded them of their own frailties and weaknesses and reminded them of God's strength and faithfulness. But all these places would also remind them that the whole journey was through a desert. They'd experienced a miracle rescue, right? But day after day, they found themselves in a desert. They might travel for days. And what do they find? More desert. The Old Testament tells us that God said he would lead them with a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. All they had to do to it was follow and each time they followed, when it stopped, they stopped, pitched their tents, looked around, and what did they see? More desert. But that was the plan, you see. It was a miracle rescue, followed by a challenging journey. God wanted to see what was in their hearts. God made it clear that he'd chosen them because he loved them. He called them the apple of his eye, his treasured possession but they would have to trust him and obey him to get to where they wanted to be. And God always proved faithful. 
So that was the plan for them, and that's the plan for us. You may not describe where you are right now as a desert, but perhaps you would. Although you've experienced a miracle rescue at salvation, most of us have discovered that the faith journey is not all plain sailing. It may not be a desert exactly, but it's certainly not always easy. And you and I can probably look back and look at particular times of our lives, perhaps particular jobs, particular circumstances that were lonely and felt like a desert. Jesus didn't promise an easy life. He said, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Again, in Hebrews it says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Like the children of Israel, we are in a tough journey. It's only possible to survive because God is faithful and meets our needs. I hope you've experienced that. You are where you are, and God is with you. And that gets us to the third truth. You know where you're going. You know where you're going. You see, in every journey, you have to keep your attention fixed on the destination. It's the whole point of the journey, isn't it? The scenery might be lovely. The picnic on the way might be delicious. The people that you're with might be great company. But the point of the journey is to get where you're going. For Israel, that destination uh, was the place that God had promised them. The place of plenty. The place of peace. The place to celebrate and live life to the full. A land flowing with milk and honey. They weren't sure where it was, but they knew they just had to follow. And one day they would come to the end of their travelling through the desert and walk into an amazing inheritance, a promised land. And they did, though not all of them. Many missed out. And to look at how and why that was is another story for another day. But the original plan was for all of them to get there. So does that, uh, that truth of a glorious destination have relevance for us? The answer, of course, is a resounding yes. The Bible speaks clearly of eternal life for those who trust and follow Jesus. The destination, the place where you will end your journey, paradise and heaven itself, a place of peace, a place of abundance, a place of celebration. You and I as Christians are headed for a glorious destination. Paul writes in Corinthians, if only for this life we have hope, we are to be pitied more than all men. If all we had to look forward to was more desert, oh dear. For the Israelites, the entry point to their destination was, the, was another stretch of water, the River Jordan. But of course, the entry point for us is the end of our life death itself. But for the Christian, death is not the end of everything, simply a door to a new place. Jesus said this, do not let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be with me where I am. Now, talking about death is delicate ground, isn't it? So I'll be as sensitive as I can, because I know that talking about death, you know, will reconnect you with the loss of some that you held very dear, and the grief that you still experience. We don't like to talk about it too much. 
death represents the end of your opportunity to uh, complete all those ambitions and hopes that you had for this life. And there's a very natural fear of the process of dying. It's usually unpleasant, whether it be slow and painful or quick and traumatic. It's, it's not good. It's not nice. But also there's a huge amount of uncertainty, even among Christians, about exactly what happens when we do die. So when the possibility of death looms up suddenly in front of us, it can be very scary. So I recognize this is tender ground. But with the utmost respect and all the sensitivity that I can muster, the truth is we're all nearer to that place today than we were yesterday. Whether Christ should come or call, whether he should come in glory with all the saints, with a loud shout and a trumpet sound, or whether he calls you personally to your own personal rendezvous with him, he is coming. And good news, we have a great hope. The truth for a Christian is that because Jesus was raised from the dead, so also you will be. The New Testament describes him as the first among many. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The Bible is full of assurances of eternal life with Jesus. The most famous, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Most people only have a very sketchy idea of what God does tell us. There's a book that was uh, published just last year. There's a picture of it in there. All About Heaven by a man called David Oliver. David's part of the Salt and Light family of churches based in Oxford. And he wrote this following the death of his son. His son was only 38. Um, and he wrote it partly in response to his own questions and partly to address the widespread need for more understanding among Christians. He's a very good teacher. I recommend the book. It has some very uh, sound endorsements on the back cover, and it's a safe one to read. It's biblical and sound and sane, but very, very helpful. And he presents a clear outline of what the Bible tells us about life after death. From the Bible, he teaches us things like Paradise is real. It's not an invention of optimistic minds. Jesus is there. There'll be no sickness, tears, or suffering. It's not dull or boring. You're not going to be reclining on a cloud playing a harp. It will be a place of adventure and mystery and fulfillment. You'll have a resurrection body that's recognizable, but different, imperishable, and glorious. You will have been changed. You see, heaven is part of the journey. It's the glorious destination. And as a Christian, you're on the way. Do you know, if you're not yet a Christian, or again, if you're not sure, the journey is available to you. You can join in. You can share the experiences. And there are ups and downs, but you can share in the certainty of where that journey will take you. You join in by faith. You choose to leave behind the things that are like chains around your ankles. You align yourself with Jesus as Lord and begin a journey with him. The journey might be tough, but the destination it's paradise. So to all of you, keep going. Whether you feel you're in the desert right now or at an oasis, press on. Let's say with Paul at the end of our time, I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Are we there yet? No. But we are not where we were. We are where we are. 
and we know where we're going. Be encouraged. Keep going. 